in tonight's news edition. Jordan demands a prompt Israeli investigation into the fatal shooting of a Jordanian citizen after he crossed the King Hussein Bridge on the border with the occupied West Bank. EU diplomats prepare next level of sanctions on Russia for its failure to de-escalate the crisis in Crimea. And the missing Malaysia Airlines plane remains a mystery, while investigators voice skepticism that the airliner is the target of an attack. Good evening and very warm welcome to the news. Jordan demanded an, an immediate Israeli investigation into the fatal shooting of a Jordanian judge who crossed the King Hussein Bridge into the Israeli-occupied West Bank. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expedited Affairs Nasser Jude summoned the Israeli charge d'affaires at the Israeli embassy in Amman to express Jordan's strong condemnation of the shooting of Judge Ra'id Alaeddin Zaitir. The shooting, Jude said, was completely unacceptable and asked the Israeli diplomat to immediately convey to his government Jordan's urgent demand for a prompt investigation and a detailed report on the incident. A security source said earlier that Jordanian security authorities at the border post were informed that upon his arrival at the Israeli side after crossing the bridge, Zaitar was engaged in a brawl in which he was shot and died of his wounds. The shooting prompted a brief closure of the bridge to passengers and trucks. The public security department said the movement of passengers and cargo via the King Hussein Bridge resumed after a several hour closure ordered by the Israelis. Minister of Media Affairs and official government spokesman Mohammed Al Momani told the news at 10 that Jordan had demanded an investigation into the shooting and was awaiting for the results. For the report for the moment and for the investigation, as you know, we demanded an immediate and prompt investigation of the incident and uh, based on this investigation we expect uh, demands, we expect, we expect actions from the Israeli side and based on this we're going to decide what uh, reaction we will be taking. At this point we are following, we are in contact with the Israeli authorities through our officials in the borders as well as our embassy uh, in Israel and we are uh, uh, close in close coordination regarding the investigation going on there. And uh, at the end of the investigation, we will see uh, the facts uh, as they are, and then we will uh, see the reaction of the Israeli government regarding this incident. This is, uh, as uh, you know, for a Jordanian, took the life of the Jordanian citizen. Uh, Jordanian citizen was killed outside uh, his country. Uh, we uh, would like to see a clear and uh, a decisive measures regarding the incident and to make sure that uh, those uh, who are uh, involved in this incident are uh, punished according to the law. Swift condemnation of Israel's killing of the Jordanian citizens also came from the lower house of parliament. In a statement, the house's Palestine committee expressed its dismay and profound sorrow over the unjustified and treacherous shooting and urged the government to take a bold response. The committee called on the government to carry out its recent recommendation to expel the Israeli ambassador in Amman following an attempt at the Knesset to strip Jordan of its custodianship of holy shrines in occupied East Jerusalem. The panel demanded the government urgently modify or abolish the Jordanian-Israeli peace treaty. It said today's vicious crime against a Jordanian citizen shows Israel's disrespect and disregard of treaties. The head of the house's reform bloc Mijhim Sgur said today's shooting was a violation of Jordanian sovereignty, urging diplomatic action to punish the soldier who pulled the trigger. The Palestinian Authority also condemned the shooting at close range, calling for international intervention to stop Israeli violations at border crossings. Over to Syria. Thirteen Greek Orthodox nuns arrived in Damascus after being freed in a deal by Al-Qaeda fighters who held them for more than three months. At least 15 women were freed from Adra prison north of the capital, just a fraction of the 153 whom uh, some officials said would be included in the exchange. The mostly elderly nuns and three other women appeared in good health as they sat in a room with several other Christian clerics. Eleven of the nuns later attended a service of thanksgiving for their safe return at a church in Damascus. The Greek Orthodox Patriarch 
or Patriarchate welcomed the nuns' return and called for the release of all remaining prisoners in Syria, including two prominent Syrian bishops who were abducted in Aleppo province last April. The nuns went missing in December after Islamist fighters took the ancient quarter of the Christian town of Ma'lula, north of Damascus. Syrians throughout the Middle East look to mark the third anniversary of the conflict <coughs> excuse me, in their country that ripped the state apart and sent millions fleeing the violence. Save the children, said 10,000 children were killed in the war and the number could quickly grow as the collapse of Syria's health system worsens. A report was conducted on the effect of the deterioration of facilities and medicine available to children. It said a lack of basic medical child care could cause more serious suffering in the country. Save the Children's Regional Director in the Middle East and Eurasia said the report sheds a light on the difficulties faced by both doctors and patients inside the country. The same with the report is basically there's been a complete collapse of much of the health system inside Syria. Um, we're seeing situations, for example, in Aleppo, um, where 36 doctors are looking after around two and a half million patients um, across the city. So a system that's collapsed, 60% of health facilities have been damaged or destroyed. And as a result of that, we're seeing some really terrible outcomes for children. The fate of the missing Malaysia jet remains a mystery, as dozens of ships and aircraft from seven countries scour the seas. A senior source involved in preliminary investigations in Malaysia said the failure to quickly find any debris indicated the plane may have been broken up mid-flight, which could disperse wreckage over a very wide area. Here's more. Search and rescue planes scour the waters off southern Vietnam, looking for any trace of a Malaysia Airlines jetliner. The aircraft vanished from radar screens in the early hours of Saturday, with 239 people on board. Flight MH370 from Kuala Lumpur went missing about an hour into its flight to Beijing. Malaysia's civil aviation chief has said the fate of the missing jet remains a mystery. He didn't rule out a hijacking as a possible cause. And as far as we are concerned, we are equally puzzled as well. The the Honourable Prime Minister used the word perplexing. We are equally puzzled as well. And to, to be confirmed what really happened on that particular day on this ill-fated aircraft, we need hard evidence. We need concrete evidence. We need parts of the aircraft. More than 20 aircraft and 40 ships from seven nations are involved in the search. A Vietnamese Navy plane had reported spotting an oil slick and an object in the sea, but all sightings of debris from the plane are unconfirmed. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we have not found anything that appears to be objects from the aircraft, let alone the aircraft. We will be in intensifying our efforts to locate the missing aircraft. Here in China's capital, anxious relatives are getting ready to travel to Kuala Lumpur for news. They've been told to prepare for the worst. Over to Libya, where the country's parliament has ordered a special force to be sent within one week to liberate all rebel-held ports in the volatile east. The move raised the stakes over a blockage that has cut off Libya's vital oil revenues. The conflict over oil wealth is increasing fears that Libya may slide deeper into chaos. The fragile government has failed to rein in dozens of militias that now defy state authority. The rebels have seized three ports and partly control a fourth in the OPEC member country and said they would resist any government attacks. With tension escalating, government forces seized a tanker that had loaded crude and the rebel-held Isidr port. United Nations representatives condemned the seizure of the Libyan oil ports. Nationwide demonstrations have taken place since early February against the continued tenure of the General National Congress. Strong resentment and animosity has grown between the two main though not homogeneous camps. 
Libya faces the risk of embarking on a new trajectory of unprecedented violence. The Ukrainian government said it would sign a political associ association agreement with the European Union on the 21st of this month to boost ties. Ukraine intends to submit to international courts complaints about Russia, Russian actions in the Crimea Peninsula. The United States said it needs to see concrete evidence if Russia prepared to engage on diplomatic proposals regarding Ukraine. We get more in this report. The standoff over Ukraine continues into another week. Western diplomats are racing to contain the geopolitical fallout, threatening sanctions on Moscow and gathering funds needed to shore up Ukrainians' finances. British Foreign Secretary William Hague reiterated that Moscow will face sanctions if it does not scale down its actions in Crimea. There will be costs and consequences for Russia. Uh, if no such progress is made, and indeed far-reaching consequences uh, in the event of a further Russian intensification uh, of these dangers and of this crisis. Polish Foreign Minister Radoslaw Sikorski said his country is ready to work with Russia in a contact group. But he said Warsaw is ready to take action if Moscow does not work towards the diplomatic route. If um, no um, de-escalation moves happen, or if Russia goes into Ukraine mainland, or indeed uses its forces in Moldova to do similar things as uh, are being done in Crimea, uh, the uh, sanctions that we'll consider will, will be much more severe. At a meeting with President Vladimir Putin, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said Moscow had drawn up proposals to return the Ukrainian situation back to a legislative framework which would take into account all Ukrainian interests. We have prepared a counter-offer together with members of the Security Council of the Russian Federation. It aims to bring the Ukrainian situation into the framework of international law which would consider the interests of all Ukrainians. Several thousand people demonstrated against Russia in the Black Sea port of Odessa as the standoff between Russian forces and besieged Ukrainian troops intensified. Many of the protesters who camped out during the political crisis have gone home, but some demonstrators are still determined to continue their protests and are being supported by local communities. Russian forces took over a military hospital and a missile base in Simferopol, the Crimean Peninsula's main administrative city, as the officials geared up for a referendum on the region's future. In the eastern city of Donetsk, protesters rejected Kiev authorities, with some calling for complete separation of the Donbass region and others calling to join Russia. In the Russian capital, hundreds gathered to show their support for the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine and called for both peace and the annexation of the southern Crimean territory. Russia's seizure of the Black Sea Peninsula, which began more than 10 days ago, has so far been bloodless. But should the situation in Ukraine deteriorate, the West might be forced to consider additional actions. Louis Balkar for the News at 10. And back here at home, Her Majesty Queen Rania joined students from Al Aman Fund for the Future of Orphans in a vocational training workshop in cooperation with Al Quds College. The workshop, which was held at the college premises, discussed the outcomes of the vocational training campaign to promote vocational training among Jordanian youth. Queen Rania praised the partnership between the two organizations and stressed the importance of changing society's mindset towards vocational jobs. The Queen also stressed the private sector's key role to encourage youth to participate in vocational training as well as partnering with training centers. After attending the workshop, Her Majesty toured the college facility and dropped in on a few classes. To date, the number of Al Laman Fund beneficiaries who studied at Al Quds College has reached 254, 130 of whom joined through the vocational training campaign launched last year. Founded by Queen Rania in 2006, Al Laman Fund for the Future of Orphans is an independent NGO registered under the Ministry of Social Development to support the orphaned youth in Jordan. 
A painting by Italian Baroque master Caravaggio is set to make its Asia debut in Hong Kong tomorrow. The supper at Emmaus, created in 1605 or 1606, left its usual home at Milan's Pinacoteca di Brera Museum and arrived in the former British colony last night. The emotional painting shows a moment of revelation. After his resurrection, a tired Jesus Christ met some of his disciples at Emmaus. They did not recognize him until he broke bread and gave it to them. Caravaggio, known for his inventive use of light and shadow, explored the same subject nine years previously in 1601. The 1601 version is now displayed at the National Gallery in London. We begin with the Champions League. Arsenal held a last home training session ahead of their Champions League last 16 second leg match away to title holders Bayern Munich on Tuesday. Bayern won the first leg at Arsenal 2-0, so the Gunners have a tough task ahead, while their opponents hope to become the first team to retain the trophy. Boca Juniors beat bottom of the table racing 2-1 to jump seven places in the Argentina Championship. Juan Sanchez Mino opened the scoring for Boca with a quick shot that defeated racing goalkeeper Sebastian Saja. It was Saja who scored the equaliser in the 68th minute when the goalkeeper stepped up to take a penalty kick. Christian Erbis sealed the win for Boca in the 76th minute. Boca Juniors are now seventh in the points table with 10 points behind Godoy Cruz and River Plate with 11. And World Rally champion Sebastian Ogier took the lead in the overall standings after winning the Rally of Mexico ahead of Volkswagen team Matt mate Yari Mati Latvala. The victory was the Frenchman's second of the season and the team's first 1-2 of 2014. Belgian Thierry Nouvelle was a distant third for Hyundai's first podium finish. Britain's Elfin Evans finished a career best fourth in a Ford, while Polish teammate Robert Kubica returned, retired after rolling his car twice in two days. Finally, a look at the weather forecast. Cold tonight in most regions with southwesterly light winds. Relatively cold weather will continue to affect the country tomorrow, with rain forecast in the north extending to the central regions in the evening hours. Winds will be southwesterly brisk, changing to northwesterly. The Jordan Valley should expect a warm day tomorrow, with a high of 25 degrees at the Dead Sea. And further south, the Gulf of Aqaba should expect fair conditions tomorrow, with northerly brisk winds and slightly choppy seas. The weatherman warns of poor visibility during the late night and early morning hours tomorrow due to fog. Next are the lows and highs for tonight and tomorrow. And to close, here's a reminder of the day's top stories. Jordan demands a prompt Israeli investigation into the fatal shooting of a Jordanian citizen after he crossed the King Hussein Bridge on the border with the occupied West Bank. EU diplomats prepare next level of sanctions on Russia for its failure to de-escalate the crisis in Crimea. And the missing Malaysia Airlines plane remains a mystery while investigators voice skepticism that the airliner is the target of an attack. And that's the end of tonight's news. My name is Ra'ad Lupoush. Thanks for watching and have a good night.